My name is Daniela Domeisen. I am an assistant professor at ETH in Zurich in the Department of Environmental System Sciences. I am a physicist by training and before coming to ETH I spent research time in the US and in Germany and in the UK. Now I have a research group here at ETH and together we work on the global circulation of the atmosphere. This means we work on understanding how the atmosphere moves and why it does this and wh what kind of impacts that might have on our surface weather. In our research, we use a range of different tools, anywhere from numerical models that are small enough to be run on a laptop to very highly complex models that have to be run on a supercomputer. In addition to that, we look at data science method and AI methods that can help us work on trying to understand how the atmosphere works. One of the main focus areas of our research is predictability. So we're working on trying to predict the weather, but not just a few days in advance, but further ahead of time. So anywhere from two weeks to several weeks to months and years in advance. So in order to make good predictions on timescales of two weeks or longer, we need different processes in the atmosphere than just the fundamental equations of the atmosphere in the models. We need different processes on every time scale. In particular, if you look at, for example, two weeks and we want to predict the weather over Europe, then we need to understand how the weather looks like over the North Atlantic or over North America. If you go to longer time scales, we can use other factors such as um, the ocean surface, because the ocean moves much slower than the atmosphere. We can look at the land surface, sea ice cover, snow cover. We can look at the upper atmosphere. Anything that moves slower and has some kind of connection to the region we're trying to predict is helpful for making long range predictions. On very long time scales, such as climate change time scales, we can then use greenhouse gas emissions in order to predict what happens in the future. So if you want to make um, good predictions on time scales of weeks to months, we need to look at other regions often to make a good prediction. For example, Europe turns out to be one of the places on Earth with the poorest predictability all over the globe. This means that we have to go to other regions that have an influence on Europe and try to understand what happens there and how it influences Europe to make predictions for Europe. The tropics are one such area that we can use for these predictions and we've shown, for example, that if you use the tropics to make better predictions for Europe, that works especially in winter. This is just one example of processes that we can use in the atmosphere and in the climate system in order to make better predictions for one such region. Of course, there's lots of other regions that might also have poor predictability where we can use these methods in order to understand that. Machine learning and data science have already had a strong influence on weather prediction. For example, we use data science methods for parametrizations in models. As an example, these are empirical equations um, connecting different parts of the climate system. These can be derived from uh, machine learning. We also use it for downscaling, we use it for pre and post processing of model data, we use it for gap filling in observations. So there's a range of different usages. But what we would also like to do is to use AI for better understanding the atmosphere in the first place and also understand the full climate system. This we can do with a range of different um, tools. One of the important tools and actually the way that weather forecasts were made in the old times, so far back 100, 150 years ago, was to look at what the weather was like in the past and then match it with what the weather is like today and therefore make a better forecast. Because if you know how the weather from a particular pattern evolved in the past, you might be able to use that for understanding how the weather um, develops in the future. These types of analog models are already used. They're already used in an industry context, but also in a research context. And they already outperform these dynamical physical models for very specific locations, very specific applications. For example, if you want to predict an extreme event far into the future, then we can look at past weather and how it has evolved in the past. This is one way to combine weather forecasting and AI. 
but we also want to try to better understand what happens in the atmosphere. And for this, we can use more interpretable methods from AI that help us, for example, identifying which regions might be important for predicting a particular other regions because they are connected in some way on these longer timescales. So what we're also working on is developing the dynamical models themselves, but also predicting the machine learning models at the same time. So it's a kind of a co-development of the two processes. One thing we're doing with the physical models themselves that contain kind of the governing equations, the fundamental equations of the atmosphere, is to go towards higher and higher resolution. We're doing this, for example, at the Center for Climate Systems Modeling here at ETH. At the same time, um, there is Earth digital twins that are being, being developed right now, where we're looking at all, like putting all the data together in one place and that can then be used at very high resolution also for weather forecasting, but also for, for example, impact models. With impact models, we found that actually the main limitation for impact models if you want to predict, for example, an extreme event, is still the extreme event itself. Actually predicting, for example, a heat wave far into the future is still much more difficult than then actually predicting its impact, which we are getting much better at and which is also a process that we can use machine learning for. We've also launched, for example, an AI competition for weather forecasting on timescales for several weeks to several months, together with the World Meteorological Organization and the Swiss Data Science Center. And we're very excited to see what kind of ideas and methods people come up with in order to predict the weather several weeks into the future. So for the future, we think that there has to be a continued co-development of both AI methods, but also of the dynamical models. The benefit of having the dynamical models is that we actually have governing equations that we understand and that we can um, predict into the future. The benefit of AI is that with much less computing power, we can often achieve parts of those goals that we can with the physical models. So I think that in the end, the best way to do this is to combine these models, to create hybrid versions of weather prediction models. And I'm pretty confident that this will actually be done over the next um, couple of years. We're working on this to try to understand how to better bring these two sciences together. So we know that, for example, with climate change, extreme events are becoming a lot more frequent with, in the future. For example, heat waves or extreme precipitation events are projected to become a lot more severe and a lot more frequent in the future. This will have devastating consequences for the humans and the ecosystems that are then impacted by these. Heat waves, for example, cause a lot of human uh, mortality or morbidity, and ecosystems can die from these kinds of events. Now, if we know these events are becoming more frequent, we have a very strong motivation to also be able to give people an advance warning when these happens. Right now, we have an advance warning of maybe two weeks, but we're hoping to certainly extend this further to um, several weeks or a month ahead of these extreme events so that we can give warnings to people ahead of time. So I would expect that, for example, about 20 years from now, we have very advanced combined hybrid models between dynamical models and AI models. And these models would be able to not just tell us a forecast longer in advance than what we currently have, they would also tell us when it's useful to look at a forecast. So when can we actually make a good forecast and at what times we might not be able to look at that particular forecast. This will be very important information for both meteorologists, but also for people making decisions for municipalities for entire countries.